welcome, heartfelt welcome to everybody uh, for a very special evening of reflection, of togetherness, and to a virtual art collaboration. I'm Catalina Island Museum Executive Director Julie Perlin Lee, and I am so pleased you're all here as we look back tonight on Elizabeth Turk's 2019 Tipping Point sculpt sculpture installation and inauguration at the Catalina Island Museum. So if you haven't done it already, right now for your best viewing experience, please go ahead and place your views on presenter view. Um, that will give you the full screen uh, visibility of the program this evening. Um, at the end of this program, which we are recording, so you know, we will be asking you to participate in a digital art piece. Um, I have reminded most of the group already, but if you have just joined us, if you haven't already, please do grab a piece of paper um, and a um, thick line pen marker or Sharpie, something so that we'll be able to see um, what you've written on this piece of paper. And also some sort of handheld light device. Um, this can be something like an electric candle, a flashlight, a match, even something like your cell phone flashlight, anything that can illuminate a particular moment that will come later in the evening in this time together. So um, gosh, leave it to Elizabeth Turk to guide us towards making a, another historical moment, I think in Zoom history here tonight. So um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the project. So as an art installation, Tipping Point consists of a large maze of movable metal screens patterned with endangered and extinct birds flowing in migration patterns. And I'm so fortunate that right behind me in my office, I have one of these extra panels, um, which really gives you an idea. So if you can imagine these panels assembled in concentric circles um, and that are movable, um, that you can move and interact with on a large platform outside, you know, like a maze even. And the outermost panels of this beautiful sculpture um, are evocative of crosshairs and targets. Um, and in the center are mirrored panels that erase the visibility of anyone who makes their way through the sculpture and finds themselves in the interior of it. Um, and to the outside, you as a participant in this sculpture disappear. Um, accompanying this interactive sculpture, this large cage-like interactive sculpture, are several stacked aluminum discs mod modeled after sonograms, which are um, made from recorded bird and sea animals. Um, that is to say that these sculptures are the visible representations of how sound is visually represented, represented by lines when recorded. Um, standing together, Turk's sound columns create the physicality of sound, sound that is ephemeral, and the sound of animals that have or very might well disappear, um, become extinct during our lifetime. So as a whole, Tipping Point as a project addresses the concept of extinction. And it posits that by allowing us to interact with these artworks, that each of us can be thoughtful and um, thoughtful about what existence means across all spans of time, past, present, and into the future. Tipping Point makes a monumental issue, a huge issue, extinction, and it breaks it down into a very tangible experience that makes it approachable. So tonight we're going to revisit the inaugural event, um, the evening of Tipping Point here, uh, which was an incredible collaboration of art, music, dance, photography, and public participation. Together, we came together all dressed in white so that we, the participants, would disappear into the photographic processes of the evening. And we were asked at that point to reflect on what it is that we treasure, um, what, it is, what it is that we can't stand to lose, what we couldn't bear to lose, um, to think about being at a tipping point. 
And using electric candles that we were given, and here's mine from that evening, we wrote those words in the air and played together to create a collective canopy of light. It's beautiful. So let's take a look back now at a video from that evening. So, wow, so the, the, um, there was a little scratchiness there, but in general, I think everyone can see if you were, if you were there, I'm sure that brought back really amazing memories for you, uh, for me, every time I see that. Um, so Elizabeth, welcome, welcome to tonight, and thank you so much for being here with all of us. And what I really want to ask you about is, um, about your own reflections on this on that evening um, when we gathered uh, when we were thinking on a uh, um, about loss together on this large scale um, and now uh, your thoughts as um, we've shifted in time and it seems like everything now that we are in the midst of a global pandemic um, and confronted with a collective experience of loss um, just can you speak to that for us please as everybody is probably um, tired of hearing, it feels incredible, right? And we, know, we don't want to shift and make this a new normal. 
So um, first of all, I should say thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight because I know there's a lot going on. Um, but also, thank you for, for taking the risk to go out and, and be a part of a completely new experiment and, and experience out on Catalina Island. I had this idea that maybe with the feeling of play and playing together, even if it were, if, even if it was going to be with strangers, maybe that could create a different environment around a topic that is so heavy. And that if in fact we could create something beautiful in the end together, that that would um, create a, a different type of memory. So I think that when we talked about um, this evening, I think I was reflecting on so much of the process as, as being in, much more intellectual when I started. You know, the concepts, you could see extinctions um, around all of us, you know, whether it's an Australian fire or just doing the research on the, all the bird shapes. The extinctions began with very simple habitat change. And so I think it has been in the air for, for so many years, yet it's very gray and intangible and it doesn't impact our daily life. Um, but it feels like it's impending and it's getting closer and closer that these changes will affect us. Little did I know that only one year later, it would in, impact us in such a way that I think if I were to think through the process again, I would have so much more of an intimate response. I thought of things like, I just thought very large intellectual um, ideas around the concept of extinction. Now I think of things very simply, the hugs, the hugs of when I meet somebody, the clamoring of restaurants, the smiles of strangers, um, all those physical things that I miss in daily life. I never thought about those as clues and, and moments of potential loss. So I think that that stays with me so dramatically. So yes, absolutely, certainly. And I think um, for all of us who were participating um, and, um, you know, so many elements came together, which is so fascinating to me um, in the working, uh, we started with a visual art project, which turned into this performance that brought together people from all aspects across the art field, which was absolutely amazing. And um, as we saw in the last video, and I think anyone who was there, I think um, arguably one of the most mesmerizing parts of the evening um, was watching Laura Wilson and the Assembly Dance Company. Um, and they were given the cue to dance as if they were the last of a species, to perform a dance as if they were the last of a species. And can you tell us more about why you wanted to bring the physicality of dance to Tipping Point, to the project, and what you hoped we as onlookers um, would take away from that intimacy of their movements? Well, I thought the last of the species was such a powerful um, point of reflection. And I thought if they were in black and we were in white with the long exposures of the photography, um, we would start to swirl around them in, um, in very significant ways. And especially if they embodied the, the loneliness in a very beautiful way of that, of that concept, that those actions uh, would be contagious and perhaps they would be a cue to feel something different and feel something closer to what the three dimensional sculpture was, was pointing to, yet in its stillness, um, the, the way one would interact would be solely visual. I hoped that the movement 
would be a bridge to that solitary feeling and the um, and the 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 depth of that potential. It would bring us to the brink of a different type of memory. Well, they did that and they certainly were beautiful and they certainly did um, provide um, a surprise, you know, just like, um, I don't know how to say it, but as they moved through the, the our bodies, you know, they, they created this really dramatic energy as well. And so we have um, asked Laura um, to talk to us a little bit about that rehearsal and rehearsing and preparing for and then dancing for this project. So um, let's, let's take a listen to that now. I was reflecting earlier today about one of the first phone calls that Elizabeth and I had about this project and I remembered that prompt that you gave us and I had been working on another piece unrelated to this where I had a soloist who was sort of dancing as if she had already passed on into an afterlife um, and kind of saying goodbye to her body. And that section reappeared in this piece as well as one of the solos. Um, and Taylor danced it. So if you want to speak to like kind of the process of creating it, I was thinking today about dancing with the candles and I was thinking about the three of us moving together and how the connection between us had to be strong because we're focusing on holding these objects because we're not used to dancing with props all the time and so it's an extension of your body and it's also creating these photos and videos that um, leave a trail in this trace that's really like you can't quite predict what it's going to look like when you're moving so you are aware of all of these things so you just have to trust that together we are as connected as we feel so that we can also focus on these other things going on and the connection with the audience the way it's developed over time has definitely become more emotional and saying goodbye to my body um, but it was beautiful to experience there with the candle tracing because it felt very like I'm illuminating my body um, and you can only see it as I as I go through it. It was wonderful having them above us at the museum because I don't know it felt very calming in a way it's different than a usual theater setup which was interesting but I loved joining them afterwards and moving with everyone as they're discovering what to do with their candles. I've definitely felt very ob observed in that way and similar with your structure um, with that was rotating, um, that felt like each chamber was its own, not cage, but like its own like private moment that you could have in there. I had a thought earlier today that there are moments in the dance that are bird-like, like very, um, I don't know, like swirly and lots of circular motion um, and like all this movement around and we were in these long black dresses. And, um, and so I was thinking about how we normally look up to see birds overhead, but it was sort of an inversion of that with the audience looking down. And rather than a grave, maybe more like, um, like a conservatory or something at a zoo or like a butterfly house or that sort of feeling. There's one part of the dance that we did that um, I was rewatching and really stuck out to me in this particular theme because we were in a sense migrating all together and this came up a few times in the piece, but we had our individual paths. So it felt very pertinent with all of the audience members joining them afterwards because everyone was experiencing this play with you know a tool that could create something that can be captured by photos and videos and they're all experimenting and trying things together and it was fun to help lead people but also there were so many things that they were doing that we hadn't done and it was beautiful to watch 
them mm-hmm. discover these different ideas and and try it out and you know pass it among the whole group of people i felt that way even also with the structure as well like people really felt free to move in through and that and inside of it because of the way that you dancers were already interacting with it and just the fact that the structure itself is lends itself to motion the walls are movable and you can create these openings um and i i guess that applies to all of elizabeth's work that i've been involved with even just the visualization of the sound sculptures it's like it's such an apt correlation to what we do as dancers and choreographers because we're literally visualizing sound as well that's one of the jobs that we do and the superimposition of the light after the movement has occurred like that memory of the movement being the thing to look at rather than the movement itself and then a third thing the the different vantage points that Elizabeth's work always demands um, from a dance perspective I think those three things really help inform what we decide to do and and create a new visual sort of medium that isn't quite dance and isn't quite visual art. I would love for Hiwa to speak more into this moment because she is an, a wonderful improviser and a lot of these encounters were all improvised in the moment. Um, do you remember, Hiwa, any of the prompts that you gave yourself for this time? It's very different because when I'm dancing, I remember um, I'm more aware of my pattern of traveling the space and with like the whole trio too. So I think we are kind of creating an image, very clear image for the audience because they can see it very clearly from above. And um, the second set that we are dancing in the, um, kind of like the, what's that called? Like a wrong artwork. And I remember very clearly that I think there's a moment I was dancing outside of the circle and then Taylor was in the center and it was very beautiful that I cannot, I couldn't really see Taylor, uh, Taylor clearly because there's so much layer with different pattern across. So when I'm improvising, I was kind of um, like take part of her movement, inspired by her movement and improvising while because of material, I can see my own reflection as well. So I think there's just so much, uh, so many things going on at the same time. And it definitely feel like other world for me. I think that the recent crisis has been a lot more unifying because obviously everyone is affected by the same crisis, which feels unprecedented to me, but it also unites us in a way similar to the way that the, the event did. It is very like nostalgic to look back on a day when we could all ride a boat and go to an island <laughs> and do a big thing. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes, indeed. So, um, so our thanks again to Laura and the Assembly Dancers, um, all amazing, uh, just an incredible component of the night. Um, and um, so now I wanna take a moment and just um, talk to and hear from Eric Tianis, who's the lead photographer for the project and responsible for the lasting imagery that we've viewed um, and all created through a variety of video and photography. Here is Eric. It was just a really beautiful evening. And the, the neat thing that I found from this collective of photographers that some of them we'd worked with in the past, some of them we hadn't. They all had a really unique skill set and they collaborated better than than any team that we've ever really worked with before. And through doing that, it was really special because they kind of bounced ideas off of one another and the the freezing of light and the and the movement and the and the uh the interrupted movement where it was actually kind of emphasizing that that ghostliness um it was it was really powerful and i think now um people are are uh they're kind of aching for that kind of connection and community and that kind of speaks to 
endangerment and uh, extinction. You know, when you have to look backwards and and ache for something that used to be. So I think uh, ache, we're aching, we're aching all of us. So, but I cannot say enough, and I know that goes for Elizabeth and our whole team too, about Eric's vision and his approach um, to capturing the event um, and for making the ephemeral eternal um, through the magic of photography. So Elizabeth, um, looking back on all of these images and seeing everyone in motion and in play, um, what surprised you about that evening or how participants reacted to your directive to write what they fear or to respond or react um, just in general with the collab uh, collective response? When I look at those images, I am overwhelmed at how beautiful the canopy um, with no practice, with no uh, rehearsal or just by doing. The canopy that everybody created was so real it's so physical and yet while everybody was doing it they didn't see what they were doing it's like riding blind you know and i think that that's often how we go through life and it was it was fantastic what they produced and how engaged you know it's hard to be uh creative it's hard to go forth into the unknown and every single person that uh, was a part of the audience, just stepped into that zone um, unafraid and, and I hope um, met new friends as a result of it. But also look at what a beautiful piece you created, especially those shots at the end where all the energy that people um, produced or held, um, held tight just exploded into the air. It was tremendous. I love those images. I think I even remember at one point a conga line started. <laughs> it got pretty energetic. It got, I love how that line goes through and that it's just pure energy. And that's, that's part of what I love and I miss. The, the, the fact that I can't um, do that kind of close action. And yet we didn't even realize what a point uh, what a tipping point we were at, and yet that that line, that pure energy, really um, holds that essence true. So I, w I was impressed. So likewise, likewise. So um, and then after the inauguration of the event, um, the the installation of the event. Uh, we began, if you recall, we began to see a higher frequency of headlines about our natural and animal world at a tipping point. And in some ways, it really started to feel like a validation of the timeliness of the project. But it also was a real stark reminder of the urgency of the con conversations and the actions that really needed to take place. Um, and so what is your hope um, you know, for those who have experienced Tipping Point um, as the installation or in that event, or even tonight in this program, what is your hope that they take away and remember from this? I hope that it stays with you. I hope that it transforms you in the sense of um, a continual changing reflection. That those, that story of uh, the, the saving of the bald eagle, which your island is so proud. Um, in this area, you have an example of something like DDT that's so overwhelming, and yet it, it with a little focus, it completely changed um, into, in a very positive direction, just step by step. So I love that small change can also bring enormous um, and constant change. So I think that that's, I think that I hope that, that the questions, the actual questions stay with you or stay with one. Because they stay with me now and I, because I am so amazed at how, even though I was deep, deep into the subject, I had no idea what it would feel like. And it's hardly a year. It wasn't even a year when it just hit us all in the face. And so, so with such strength. So I think I'm going to reflect on it annually come July and August every year. How far are we away from that performance when I 
tried to flag it in a beautiful way. Well, it was a beautiful way. So thank you for that vision and for helping us to see it and um, for bringing us together. Um, and even today for bringing us together when we are now apart. Um, but that research, that part of that, you know, uh, one of the key players to this whole project um, was the Macaulay Library of Cornell, um, at the uh, Cornell Laboratory. Um, you use them, the laboratory, as a source for your research on birds um, bird, and bird extinction. And they also provided the um, sonograms that you use to uh, model the sound column sculptures and also recordings that can be heard here at the museum uh, interactively when people are experiencing the sculptures in general. So um, we did reach out to um, Kathy Boardman at Macaulay um, just to kind of get her feedback, which is so interesting. We're going to play that in a second here. We asked her about the relationship between birds and humans during this recent um, stay at home or shutter, you know, be in place at home. So uh, let's listen to her observations now, which are fascinating. We do know that birds in urban areas often sing louder and some sing at a higher pitch to be heard over the rumbling of the traffic noise. So in these areas, you have some birds who are me trying to sing loud or get their voices heard because we know that birds sing to attract mates, right? And to communicate with their partners, warn of danger and all of these things. But the other thing is, is that you can hear better now. So we have all these examples of people all over the world, especially in India, where they're like, oh my gosh, I heard XYZ birds from my window today in my balcony and they're all recording the birds they've seen and hear and it's just because COVID forced us inside and sort of in our immediate surroundings, like it forced us to open our eyes to something that's always been there and we just never paid attention to it. Right, which is so totally amazing. I heard that the number one activity right now in America, or one of the number one top activities in America right now is bird watching, which I think is amazing. So um, from my friend, uh, friends Gary and Kelly Johnson out there, this is a personal reminder to watch for the starlings. So um, it's been just over a year since we gathered for Tipping Point. Um, and it was seriously one of the most ambitious and most rewarding projects for the museum. And actually for Catalina Island, um, through Elizabeth's vision, um, her interest in our island, and just the world at large, we've had the opportunity to address the threat of extinction while championing our own success stories like that of the bald eagle here at home. Um, so a year ago, we never imagined to be in this position. And I'm so grateful for everyone who participated. And um, one of those people, Carrie on Muse, has provided um, a work of a phenomenal piece of poetry we're gonna hear, see at the end, the very finale of our program today. Um, but first, let's hear her thoughts because I think she really beautifully encapsulates the experience of Tipping Point then and now. The dancing actually brought me to tears several times and it transported me to um, just the overall theme and the awareness of it. So I, I, I really felt like it was such a vital transition for us as spectators to see you all dancing down there. I completely forgot, you know, where I was and got lost in the movement myself my journey for, for through that piece and that work was um, very much a, a solitary experience. To see the actual bird calls, you know, in a sculptural form, it was something that I hadn't truly contemplated prior to being present. Extinction was on my mind but it, even the broader sense of an explosive silence where, you know, a whole group is gone. We could never hear them in any other fashion. Before I got into myself, it, it was a real long journey. The, the isolation, um, the ability to congregate in mass numbers without any type of apprehension or um, fear definitely makes me reflect like wow it was powerful in the moment but it's even more powerful now with the distance not being able to have that same experience or share well share that same experience is what she ended up saying so 
Um, thank you. So, okay, are you all ready? Because this really is going to be um, <laughs> the most exciting part of the night for all of us. Um, but before we start this experiment, Elizabeth, um, do you have any final words for us? I just want to thank you once again for the experience of, of experimenting on your island and taking a, a topic that's difficult, making um, it playful on the verge of silly and having everybody embrace it in, a, uh, in an earnest fashion. And as a result, create, being able to create something really new and and um, beautiful. So thank you very much. And thanks for even engaging in, uh, in this ex experimental virtual extinction. <laughs> I have my candle. I'm ready to go. We're ready. <laughs> Perfect. So this might be, we, I think we're making history tonight here, everybody, because I think this might be the very first public digital kinetic light art created on Zoom ever. <laughs> so thank you for being part of it. Um, again, if you can grab something, uh, some sort of light source, if you have a candle, a digital light, a lighter, a cell phone light, a flashlight, anything that has a light um, on it, and um, as well as if you ha have already um, a, sheet, a sheet of paper, because Elizabeth in the Tipping Point Echoes of Extinction Project asks us to think about that which we hate to lose or can't live without, that which we treasure. But a year later, she wants to ask, and, um, and, and rightfully so. I think we're at a moment where we really um, have personalized what it means to, to really lose things, people, experiences, sounds. And, um, and so we would love for you to take a moment, and if you can, on a piece of paper, um, write down what you miss. It could be, you know, anything, a word, um, a person, place, sound, anything. And in a moment, we're going to ask you all to take your view from um, a presenter view and go to gallery view so that we can see all of your faces to show us what you missed and then to take your light and we're gonna create our own light show again. And, um, and just have fun with it. Show us your sign, wave your light, click to your heartbeat, draw a word, or just totally go wild. It doesn't matter. We're gonna put music by Michael Martillo on for one minute. And when the music ends, our lights and our signs will be extinct and we'll be left with the beautiful words of Kyrian Muse. So thank you, everybody. Uh, again, we're looking forward to seeing and creating this artwork with you. Thank you for being with the Catalina Island Museum and Elizabeth Turk tonight.